be here with you to again to deliver God's word. This morning we're going to be talking about a Christian's attitude. They say attitude is everything. Attitude goes a long way in life. If you have a positive attitude and positive outlook, things will go, go well. But as one brother would, would, would say, if we, if we live as if we've been weaned off a lemon, you won't get much accomplished. We need to be weaned off the pure milk of the Word. That's, of course, 1 Peter chapter 2. Of all your possessions... Few will ever bring you as much joy as having the right attitude. It determines your approach to life. It determines your relationship with people. It determines your relationship with God. It is often the only difference between success and failure is our attitude. At the beginning of a task, it often affects the outcome more than anything else. Did you know that your attitude can turn your problems into blessings. It can. So much of life is attitude, and you can choose your attitude. We all can choose our attitude. How we look at things. And of course, the, the Epistle of Philippians is a good, is a, is a letter that presents a good attitude written by Paul toward the close of his first imprisonment in Rome. Paul did not know how long he would be, remain in prison. He did not know for sure if he would get out of prison alive. And he did not let imprisonment kill his joy in Christ. He did not allow that situation to, to rob him of having that joy in Christ Jesus. Amen. And such, such should be the case for us today. So we, let's consider Paul's recipe for joy. Number one, consider others more important than yourself. We're not all that in a bag of chips. Number one, it's all about Christ. Jesus spoke on the Sermon on the Mount about our works, that they should glorify our Father who is in heaven. God gets the glory in life. Paul would write, Paul writes here in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. Let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. This displays the mind of Christ because he put others before himself. And so much so, much so should we. Selfishness and conceit are the number one robberies of life. If our minds are devoted upon ourselves, we won't get very far in life. It certainly won't be pleasing to God. So selfishness can cause a person to never be satisfied with what, what he has. He will want more and more and more. Contentment is needed in the life of a Christian. Selfishness causes a person to be rude to and even envious of others. That is entirely possible. If Paul had spent all his time thinking about how he was suffering as a prisoner, he probably would have missed the opportunity to teach. Consider Philippians 1, 12-14. Paul writes this, Now I'm, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. What an attitude from a man in prison. He's in a Roman prison. who was notorious for not taking much care of prisoners. But, he, but look at how Paul's outlook on this. My circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole praetorian guard and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Look at the example that Paul gives for us. 
He is in a Roman prison. And yet, he is bold to speak and proclaim the gospel. And his influence is known even to the guards that are guarding that cell. And to even the prisoners. And not only that, he had to be known to the brethren that around the, at least around the area of Philippi, that he's writing his letter to, and, and to those around in Rome who would have noticed, hey, he, he's in prison, he's proclaiming the gospel, and the Philippians that are reading this, hey, if Paul, if Paul can do this in a Roman prison cell, then how, how more can we hear? That's the same attitude that we should have. Put others far more than ourselves. Let's, think of, let's make the best out of life, even out of the circumstance that we are. And Paul says, because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Boldness. Focusing upon the souls of others. That's a, that was Christ's mission. Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. He came with a mission to save souls. Christ put others before his very own. One of the cases that we can put is in John chapter 4 when he meets the woman at the when he teaches the woman at the well. And after he teaches the woman the well, the woman at the well is going off into the, to the city and t telling people about, Look, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. And your disciples come up to Jesus wondering if he had any food. What was Christ's conclusion of that? My food is to do the will of my Father who sent me. Jesus would rather at that moment forsake a meal at lunchtime and use that opportunity to teach. Because, he, because that soul mattered. That's the heart of Jesus. He put others before his very own. That's the same way that we should be. Put others before ourselves. Now we should take care of ourselves, of course. But overall, think about others. The mindset. 2 Timothy 2, 8 and 9, Paul writes again to Timothy, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment, as a criminal. But notice what Paul says. There's a but right here. But the word of God is not imprisoned. It's going to continue to be spoken. If you think more on others and less on self, you will see far more joy in life. Look for the best out of the situation that you are in. Perhaps if we do as the song says, count our many blessings, name them one by one, and it may surprise you. Actually, it will surprise you what the Lord has done. You might, you, you might be surprised to know that the blessings far outweigh the negative. It, it, when, you, when you're in life in a situation and, and it's hard, think about what God has done for you. Number one, He gave His Son. He provided us salvation. He's provided us a spiritual family. Amen. It's not the end of the world, y'all. We can have joy even in times of trial, suffering, and even bliss. And we should, main, as, as Paul begins here, maintain, fulfill my joy, maintain the same love. Again, we're all being united. It's Christ. It's our love for Christ that unites us. And if we love Christ, if Christ is our Lord, then we will love one another. And not only will we not love one another, we'll love souls just like Christ saw souls. Again, put others before our very self. Number two, do everything without grumbling and arguing. This perhaps sometimes can be better said than done at times. Consider verse 14 of chapter 2. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. How many things, Paul? All things. That you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Among whom you appear as lights in the world. Paul had plenty of reason to gripe and fuss due to his imprisonment. 
But he also faced a lot of brotherhood problems. Sometimes people close to you give you heartaches. Paul said at one point when he wrote, wrote to the church of Corinth that he had a thorn in the flesh. But he did not let that thorn stop him from, from, from his mission. Of course, God told him his grace was sufficient. Sometimes our own attitude creates a problem. As Paul says, we need to examine ourselves to see whether we're in the faith. A doctor asks an upset female patient, Did you wake up grumpy? She said, No, I just let him sleep. <laughs> Attitude. That, can, that also reminds me of the expression, Did you wake up on the wrong side of the bed? That shouldn't be the attitude of a Christian. We have Christ. We have everything. When Christ is, when Christ is Lord, we develop His, His attitude. That's right. And that's what Paul did. Paul tried to have the mind of Christ as he's telling the Philippians. Philippians 1, 15 through 18 says, Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, talking about those that preach from goodwill, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former, talking about those who are preaching Christ from envy and strife, proclaim Christ out of, a, out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. They failed to put others before themselves. They have that mindset. But notice what Paul's mindset is. Paul's mindset is not, oh man, they're, they're trying to get, get at me. So I got, I've got to have a competition with them now and see if I can outdo them. That's not what Paul, what Paul says. Continuing on, Paul says this, what then? Matter of fact, Paul says, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. They think they're going to rob me of my joy. Watch, the, watch what he says. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. Paul says it doesn't matter. That's their problem, if they're preaching out of a, out of a, out of a wrong heart. I'm not going to let that deter me while I'm in this prison cell from preaching the gospel. I'm not going to let that get to me. That's the mindset of a Christian. When others try to do something to harm us, it's our mindset to try to do something to now get back at them or is it that I'm not going to pay them no mind I'm going to continue to live in the joy of Christ they're not going to rob my joy Amen. the only one to rob you of your joy is yourself and others can if you let them if you let them rob you of your joy that, that's on us Add it, again attitude is everything Attitude determines so much in life. Grumping only draws attention to unhappiness and usually doesn't do any good. I notice this. This comes from Paul Lee's encyclopedia, uh, Tim Paul Lee, uh, the Encyclopedia of 7,700 Illustrations, and I like this. To swear is wicked because it is taking God's name in vain. To murmur is likewise wicked, for it takes God's promises in vain. That is absolutely true. Consider the children of Israel in the wilderness, even before the wilderness. God had brought them out as, as it would say, with a mighty hand. Led them out of Egypt. They come to the Red Sea. And what did they do? Moses finally brought us out here to die. They just seen the ten plagues that was put on Egypt. They just saw what God's mighty hand could do. Here, here's here's going to happen again. The Red Sea is part of it. They pass through the Red Sea. They come out on the other side. They reach Mount Sinai. Moses goes up to receive the wall. And what they do again? They already forget the promise of God. Here in Exodus, golden calf, and they start worshiping. This is the God that brought you out already. And then after that, they're, 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 on, they're wandering to the wilderness. So they're, wanting, they're, they're wanting to go into the promised land. And of course, over and over, God provides for them manna every day. 
And then they complain about that. They want meat. God gives them meat. And then they complain about that. They're just a group of complainers. You have to feel for Moses. He's having, he's having to lead these people who are constantly complaining against his leadership, against God. And several times they say, they'd be better off if he died. They'd be better off if we just go back to Egypt. Are you kidding? You, you would think as you read, read that narrative, are you kidding me? Have you not seen how mighty God is here? He's taking care of you and your basically, your basically body and hand to feed They learned that they took God's promises in vain. When God makes a promise, won't He fulfill it? That's right. He has, and He will continue to do so. Amen. When God promises eternal life, the one who faithfully follows Him, will He not give eternal life? When he promises that it's going to be all right in the end, will it not be all right in the end? Now, we may suffer death, we may suffer hardship, but that doesn't mean that life, that life is pointless. Life is pointless without Christ. But with Christ, life is so much more. And we can make it through this life. Let our attitude be that of Paul, be that of Christ. And most grumping comes from a selfish attitude of thanklessness. You know, I wonder how often do we thank God? That actually should be the first, one of the first things we pray for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm speaking to myself too. Because this doesn't just apply to you, it applies to me, me as well. How often do we come to God? Father, I want, I need, I want, I need and forget to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for this. Perhaps thank you. I'll even do this. Thank God for His ability to answer your prayer before you even ask what you need. Thank Him before you ask it. Because God is good. Amen. And however He answers that prayer, he, you know it's going to be right. Because He is God. God is just. God is fair. And God knows our needs. God is good all the time. That is true. Absolutely. But it, is that our mindset? If God is good all the time, then shouldn't all the time we be good? And we do good? That's absolutely true. Back with the idea of grumbling and arguing, it's sad to see People argue of the silliest of things. Why did, G, why did Nicodemus come to Jesus at night? Does it matter? Or are you going to gain from one? And does, and does it matter what point of view this person has versus that person? They both have this, just as valid a view as anyone else. Well, I think he came to Jesus, uh, Jesus by night because it just happened to be the time the day he came. Okay, so it's just as valid as the other one. Does it matter? Don't you have, have an argument about why he came to Jesus at night? 2 Timothy 2.14, Paul reminded Timothy to solemnly charge them that they strive not about words to no profit, leading to the ruin of the hearers. Also in Titus 3.9, to avoid uh, useless uh, strivings about the law and genealogies because they get nowhere. Is it wrong to discuss things? Absolutely not. But don't let that rob us of our unity. Don't let that rob us of our joy. Remember, we are to put the other person before our very self. And we're to have the mind of Christ. Remember, don't let anything rob us of our joy that we have in Christ. Number, number three, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Now, oftentimes when we see things in the Bible that said once, we know it's important. But when it's stated twice, that's something that you should say, hey, we should pause here and think more. Right. There is something you can do regardless of your physical circumstances. Paul says rejoice in the Lord always. What about when times are tough? Rejoice regardless because you have God on your side. Remember, remember the ending of Romans chapter 8? What shall we say then? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God is on our side, that's all we need. 
I remember watching Pirates, as a matter of fact, last night we watched Pirates of the Caribbean, and the night before, I remember they were talking about the wind and stuff, and they were, they were trying to get a, the, the person trying to give a, like a game prep talk type speech, and, and one of the sailors said, the wind is on our, our side, boys, that's all we need. God is on our side, that's all we need. We can do it. We can overcome life. Yes, life is hard, but rejoice anyways. That's right. Because that's what makes life good. Times may be hard now, but oh, it's so good because we have Christ. Amen. The Lord dominated Paul's life in every aspect. He wasn't just a side note to his life. To Paul, God was everything. Christ was everything. And that was his joy. Joy. Also comes from the encyclopedia that I mentioned earlier. This, this quote, Joy, he said, is the flag which is flown from the castle of the heart when the king is in residence there. That's right. That should be our mindset. Joy. Joy in the midst of pain. Philippians 1, 21-23, Paul says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if, if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. Here Paul is at basically a fork in the road. I don't know which, which path I would want more. Of course, to be with Christ, to, to, to be with Christ is, is, is far better, but... To remain here in the flesh, is, I will do, it's going to be fruitful labor for me. And that's what Paul continues to say. I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Of course, what was Paul's outlook? He was going to be content. He was going, to, no matter if he left to be with Christ, that would be better. But if he remained on, he was going to continue to do the work for the Lord. And he's going to still have that attitude of rejoice always. And again, I will say rejoice. Paul, Paul gives a good example of how to get along with whenever you have or whenever you don't have. Philippians 3, 7 through 8 says, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. You know what you have right here? You have exactly what it means to take up your cross, to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. Roman citizenship, you name it. I have counted all that loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the, notice, notice this, the surpassing value of just, notice this, the surpassing value of knowing Christ. Of knowing Christ. Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul saw knowing Christ worth more than anything in life. He saw that more valuable than anything he could have. The surpassing value. In other words, Paul says, my knowledge that I have in Christ, my life I have in Christ, it is not for sale. He is everything. I have lost so much for Him. He's my joy. He's my joy. In the fourth chapter of Philippians, Philippians 4, 11-13, Paul says, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. The context of Philippians 4.13 is how to, how to live no matter what circumstance you have, whether you have a lot or whether you, have, whether you don't have anything at all. The attitude of, I can I can do it. We had a brother that challenged us. He would challenge us every day he could. He was there at least. He would say, Brother, you can do it. 
That meant a lot to me. Because we can do it. Paul said so. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. I can. My mom and dad but uh, always taught me can't, can't, can't never do anything. I can, can. It reminds me of this. Have you heard the story about the little engine that could? Amen. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Wait a minute. I'm going to change that. For the Christian is, I know I can. I know I can. I know I can. I know I can. Because it's Christ who gives us that mindset that we can. We can. Why? How can, how can we know we can? Look at verse 19 of Philippians 4. And my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. I can. Because lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. No wonder Paul rejoices in the Lord. No wonder he could say, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice because God is His strength. That's right. Lean upon Him. Don't trust in ourselves. Lean upon Him. With all of our heart. And number four, think on these things. Philippians 4 and verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. If we, if we dwell our minds upon everything that is negative, we want to go nowhere in life. Life will not be as good as it can be or will be. We should, be as, we should do as Paul says, is to think on the things that even that, that describe God. These are characteristics of God. That's right. You are physically what you eat and you are spiritually what you think about all day. No wonder the psalmist could say, in his law does he meditate day and night. That word meditate means like a calf or a cow chewing the cud. He dwells on it. It's not just a it's not just a passing thought. It's constantly on the mind. You are physically what you eat and you're spiritually what you think about all day. Proverbs 4.23 Watch over your heart with all diligence. That's the same word that we have in 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourself and prove to God. Do your best. Be eager. Watch, all of your, all, watch over your heart with all your diligence. For from it flow the springs of life. People are about as happy as they want to be or choose to be. You can choose to be happy. You don't have to be sad or upset. You can choose to be happy no matter what life throws at you. Rejoice always, as Paul says. Philippians 4, 6, 7, be anxious for nothing. I heard it explained one time, do not be overly anxious. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When you're struggling through life, no matter if even, no matter even, even if you are struggling through life, if no matter where you are in life, make sure to communicate with the Father. Give Him thanks for what you have and everything He's done. Don't be afraid to get, to tell Him your needs. God's peace surpasses all comprehension. That will guard our hearts. The, the, uh, the mindset of having inner peace. There's nothing like having peace with yourself. The peace that you have in Christ. Life can hand you some very bitter pills. And it will warp your spirit only. Underline that. 
only if you let it. Life can be difficult. Right. And it can rob you of your joy if you let it. Don't let it. Let Christ be your joy and see what He can do. Paul learned to overcome his problems, and we can as well. And it all comes by determining our attitude in life. I like this by Tennyson. One ship drives east, another drives west. While the self-same breezes blow, tis the set of the sails and not the gales that bids them where to go. Like the winds of the sea are the ways of fate. As we voyage along through life, tis the set of the soul that decides the goal and not the storm and strife. Right. Where is your life going? Are we focusing upon the storm and not the master of the storm? That's what Peter did. When Peter had his eyes on the master, at that point, he wasn't worried about the storm. But when, the, when his eye caught the storm, he was more worried about the storm than looking at Jesus. And when he focused upon the storm, he began to sink. When our eyes are, have left the master and we begin to overly focus upon the storms, we will begin to sink. And our joy is being robbed. But if we look at... And that doesn't mean that we should be oblivious to things that go on. It just means that our central focus, the idea of looking in Hebrews 12, 12 2, is like me looking, I can see the exit sign right here. But yet I can see everyone here. I can still see Roger. I can still see Paulette. I can still see Carly. I can still, I can still see everyone, everyone in my purview. But my main focus at this point is the exit sign. I've got that in my sights. And that's my focus. That's the way we should be with Jesus. Jesus is my focus. Yes, I can see everything that's going on, but I'm not going to let that which, which, is going, which is going on rob me of making my goal. That's, right. that's our attitude. That should be our attitude. Mm -hmm. we're, going, we're going to heaven. And as one brother says, I love you and let's go to heaven together mm -hmm. kind of way. And that's, that's our lesson this evening. If you have a need to respond to the Lord's invitation, please come now as we stand. Matthew.